we're going to be talking now about some of the themes that emerged in the last panel to do with the challenge of political leadership today and indeed in the future. Um, and we have a very distinguished panel here, and I'll introduce them very briefly, although none of them really need much introduction as they go up and speak. Uh, my name is David Runciman. I'm the head of the Department of Politics and International Studies here in Cambridge. I'm just going to say a few brief things to set up this panel and try and pick up, as David Reynolds did earlier, for people who weren't here on some of the themes that emerged earlier on this afternoon. I think it's fair to say that the, the question for this panel is the big question, which is what about political leadership is timeless and what about political leadership is now new and different and requires to be understood in a different way. Um, I think there are two temptations at the moment uh, in contemporary politics, not just in British politics, one of which is to assume that old politics is always with us and will soon reassert itself, and the other is to assume that everything is now new and the way that people used to understand politics is redundant. Um, this is the Corbyn puzzle or question. It's almost become a cliche, the distinction between the old politics and the new politics. It's also become a kind of joke. Um, the Guardian reported on Jeremy Corbyn's conference speech on their blog that writes things up in real time. I, I read the snap verdict, and the snap verdict of The Guardian on his conference speech was that it had been second rate, badly put together, long, meandering, and poorly delivered. But that's to judge it by the standards of the old politics. By the new politics, it was a roaring success <laughs> because he very persuasively came across as someone who was not a professional politician. <laughs> and there is a serious, semi-serious question as to if that's the challenge of political leadership today, that is a very big challenge for, I think, many politicians. I just wanted to, picking up on this afternoon session, frame three broad areas where, and I'm sure our speakers will touch on these, where uh, this issue seems to be particularly acute, the question about what's what's distinctive about political leadership in 2015 and beyond, three broad themes, one of which is we are living actually in a very democratic age. There are new pressures of democracy on contemporary political leadership, and the most obvious example of that is that, and it was touched on earlier, if you want to lead a political party now, you do have to win an election for all of the main parties of the party membership, and that obviously was not true for the majority of the period that's been covered historically in this conference, to become a party leader. You did not have to win such an election, but you do now. And that puts a new kind of challenge, a new kind of premium on political leadership. And there may be things that party electorates are looking for in leaders that maybe are not the qualities that traditionally have made for strong political leadership. Um, there are other democratic forces at work, too, at the moment. There are new kinds of pressures, scrutinies, feedback, Politics is more open in many ways than it has ever been before. Maybe not open to people who want to do it, but open to input from all sorts of different sources. And representative democracy, the kind of democratic system that we have in this country and exists in most parts of the democratic world, is designed in many ways to create political leaders and political leadership. But democracy itself as an idea is actually an anti-leadership idea. It's at its roots. It's about pushing back against the idea that what matters in politics is leadership. So if we are moving into a more democratic age, that does put pressure on the idea of political leadership. The second broad theme that came up again just at the end this afternoon is we are living through a technological revolution. Not a political revolution, but a technology revolution. Um, the digital revolution may be changing the way that politics works. It may be changing the way that we should think about political leadership. It's certainly, I think, putting new kinds of pressures on political leaders, party leaders, and others. There is the pressure of the scrutiny, the kinds of scrutiny. This is the age of scrutiny. It goes both ways. They are watching us. We are watching them. And that can make leadership very hard. There is a new kind of speed to politics that did not exist for most of the period that we've been talking about. Everything is getting quicker, <clears throat> and political responses and political news, political feedback is getting quicker. I think there's also a question that hasn't been touched on, I don't think, today, which is the question, does it matter whether political leaders actually understand the world they live in or not? Um, do they understand how this technology works? Probably not. I think it's probably true that none of the leaders that we've been talking about necessarily understood the technology that was driving change. But do political leaders now even understand what it means, which is a different question? How much does it matter in an age of rapid technological change that political leaders are actually aware of the change that they are dealing with and potentially will be presiding over? I think that's a real question. And sometimes 
it is heard that as, when the next generation of political leaders comes through, they will at least understand this technology in ways that the current generation doesn't. But of course, by that time, the technology will have changed. And they may no longer understand it. So that's also, I think, um, a real question for political leadership. And then finally, before I introduce our speakers, I think there is a, a fundamental question in the 21st century about scale. That is about where power is located and what it means to be an effective political leader who wants to change the world, which I think most political leaders do. If you were going to change the world, is the nation place where you would start? I mean, it's a bit like the old joke, how would you get there? Well, I wouldn't start from here. And it's almost a truism, I think, of our world that in some respects the nation state is too big for the small problems and too small for the big problems. And it's a truism because I think it must be partly true. And that puts or raises the question, what does it mean to be a political leader at a time where the scale or the location of power may be shifting, some of it devolving down, some of it moving up? So even just within the UK context, and I'm sure Laura and others want to talk about this, what it means to be a political leader if you think that actually more leadership should be exercised at the European rather than at the national level, or what it means to be a political leader where you recognize that restoring faith in politics might require devolving certain decision-making down. How does an effective political leader manage the business of holding on to the power that the leader requires and needs to make change and recognizing that the location of power maybe has to shift? Maybe that's a timeless challenge, or maybe, as I suspect, it's a more acute challenge at the moment than it has been at some points in British political history. So those are some of the questions I think we might want to address. I'm sure there will be others as well. Um, each of the, our speakers will speak for about 10 minutes to leave us plenty of time for questions, and then we will have to try and end fairly promptly because we do have Lord Mandelson speaking to us at 5 o'clock, and we do not want to be late. Uh, so I will introduce very briefly our speakers as they come up to speak. First of all, again, someone who needs very little introduction here, Charles Clark, who is partly... Uh, the editor and responsible for the three volumes about political leadership that we've been discussing today. He has wide experience both as uh, chief of staff to Neil Kinnock, so seen political leadership from that side, but of course as uh, a member of Tony Blair's cabinet, as party chairman, secretary of state for education in the Home Office, and he's going to kick us off now. David, thank you very much for this introduction. Can I just begin by thanking Alan Packwood and the Archive Centre and the colleagues uh, who have sponsored this event. I think so far, I'm stopping probably now, it's been a great event, really fantastic. Uh, and those of us who are involved in uh, editing the books which uh, are available outside uh, couldn't appreciate more the fact that you've uh, convened such an event and you all for coming. It's been absolutely tremendous and I've certainly enjoyed it myself and I think people who have spoken to me said they seem to be enjoying it. So I really want to thank you all uh, very, very much indeed. Um, I should say that I'm of the school, that there isn't a great change. The old politics is completely different from the new politics. I think if you took the great figures of the past, Peel, Gladstone, Disraeli or whoever, and put them in the current circumstance, there's every reason to believe that they would have been able to succeed in this world as they did in that world. Though, of course, their own abilities, the techniques, the circumstances have changed absolutely dramatically over that period. What are the four, I'm going to mention, particular areas I want to mention where I think that the challenges are so great? First, the issue of long-term problems with short-term accountability. Secondly, the complexity and interconnectedness of many different types of problems. Thirdly, the 24-7 media, the instant accountability and accountability in a variety of different ways, including the role of personality in all of this. And fourthly, the declining role of political parties and therefore the sense of uh, how you manage the party unity, the party management issues which have been mentioned. I will argue that that leads to serious issues for how we conduct politics uh, in the co contemporary area. And the most important thing of all, uh, the, the failure to do so leading to the disaffection of tens of millions of people, even in a country like the UK, but looking right across the whole system, which is a massive challenge of leadership now to ensure that people are engaged in the whole process of political change. So going through those, if you look at big long-term problems that worry people, like immigration, like the welfare state, like climate change, like the ageing society, which do exercise people in a wide variety of different member, methods, where people are looking for, I don't say solutions to those problems, but at least a chance of being able to address those problems, where people see the manifestations 
of uh, the difficulties that there are in that process and say, well, what's being done? Can anybody help sort these problems out? I think there's a real collapse in the capacity of uh, individual political leaders, our political system, to address these long-term problems because the accountability is so very short-term. I organised a set of lectures two years ago called The Too Difficult Box at the University of East Anglia, where I asked a number of people to talk about the problems of these kinds of uh, issues. Another good example is the National Health Service. Is it funded enough at whatever level? And the problem that universally was described by the people who had been cabinet ministers, permanent secretaries, whatever, in that process, was they couldn't get a serious discussion about how to deal with these problems in a long-term way because the politicians, indeed the whole governmental system, not to mention the media and everybody else, were saying, well, how do you solve this short-term issue? And, of course, in politics, particularly in our adversarial system that we have here, there's a very big tendency for the opposition, whoever it is, just to how quickly have a, an attack on the government that's coming through and undermine what they're trying to do without really looking at the undermining, underlying issues. The actual level of disagreement between the main political parties, for example, on immigration reform, for example, on the welfare state, for example, on funding the health service, for example, on social care in old age, is not actually enormous. But the small differences get driven into large arguments, which then become very difficult to resolve. And at that same time, the uh, old honoured ways of doing this, the Royal Commission, the public inquiry, uh, the judicial uh, investigation, have not been able to take the, polit the political class with them in those situations. And I think the real challenge for political leaders of all parties now is to say, can we find a way of agreeing how we might solve these problems? Just to give uh, a couple of illustrations. Social care in old age is a massive problem. But trying to get agreement on how you deal with it, how you fund it, what's the balance between the individual and the society, that is a difficult question without massive differences between the party. But before very long, it becomes a death tax uh, that one party is proposing and it's taken into a very difficult area. Funding of political parties. There's an agreement ready to be done today about this issue. But actually, the Labour Party wouldn't go along with it because they're worried about the trade union relationship and all the rest of it that's involved in the process. There's a large number of problems like this, and in almost none of them is there a serious sense of progress. So the political system looks to the average citizen as very stultified, very difficult, uh, and very frozen in that situation. Second issue, connected, complexity interconnectedness. That's obvious, again, even within the UK. But I want to take the scale point that David just raised, the international nature of it. Our international institutions were basically formed relatively shortly after the Second World War to deal with the, international, the need for international cooperation at that time. But they're being found wanting. The European Union is found wanting by many, NATO, the United Nations, and actually world government that some people are frightened of doesn't exist and problems can't be resolved. So when you see an ISIL situation, a Russia in uh, Ukraine situation, when you see a climate change challenge, the in institutions of international government uh, aren't strong enough to be able to address these questions. And at a national level, it's very difficult for national political leaders or political parties to say how they should deal with these issues. For me, that leads to the question, strengthen the international institutions. So strengthen the European Union, UK membership, and so on. Strengthen the United Nations and its family of institutions. But for some, the populists in particular, it says, get out of all this lot. Uh, so Nigel Farage comes through or whatever. We can't deal with any of this. We can somehow uh, stop our country at the White Cliffs of Dover, and that sorts out our problems. Actually, uh, you can see it in the current migration issue at this very moment. Should the EU be doing more to try and address these issues, which I believe, I wrote a pamphlet on it four years ago, or should we be somehow freezing ourselves out of this, press, this issue? And that is a massive issue. We have a massive shortage at the moment in international political leadership able to work together to try and address these international problems. The third is obvious, 24-7 media, role of personality, would Winston Churchill's alcoholism, Jack Kennedy's sex life, uh, Lloyd George, whatever, have survived in the current era? Uh, now, I think it's quite an interesting judgment. I don't think it's obvious that they wouldn't, by the way, but certainly everybody is frightened of revealing any aspect of weakness in themselves because they will be uh, excoriated in some appalling way. And the point 
David, that you made about authenticity and Jeremy Corbyn is a classic illustration of that. People want authenticity in their politicians, but they also don't want them to do anything that's a bit, a bit, a bit iffy. And that is really a contradiction, because I know most politicians, certainly Labour politicians, are perfect in every possible respect you can imagine. But in some other parties, that's not the case. And so, we, so you actually have to square this authenticity versus uh, how people actually behave into a better form. But the way the 24-7 media operates, the instant accountability, the role of personality is very important. The thing I always remember is this is what James Carville, who was Bill Clinton's campaign manager, said. He wore a T-shirt on the day that Clinton won the presidential election. Speed beat Bush. And the point about speed beat Bush was in the 24-7 media, you had to deal with anything that came very quickly and very accurately. If you didn't deal with the criticism, you were lost because after half a day, it became true even though completely false. If you dealt with it quickly but wrongly, you were dead. And so you had to be deal, deal with it speedily and accurately in 24-7 media. You didn't have time to sort your line out. And that is a very difficult thing to do in all kinds of ways. But that's the meaning of the 24-7 media. And the final point, party unity, declining role of political parties. Phil Cowley, I'm not sure if he's here today, he was on the, on the list, has charted the extent of rebelliousness in Parliament and how that has increased over time. And that's true of all parties. The idea of party unity, meaning that a political leader can rely on the support of his or her party in just about all circumstances, is simply not the case. The whole politics of Parliament is completely transformed. And that is a challenge of political leadership, probably taking you back to a Victorian era, in fact, in the way that it looks like, but it's certainly different from much of the post-1945 period. Conclusions of these four problems. Firstly, the conduct of politics has to change absolutely dramatically. I won't set out here all of the ways in which I think that that has to happen, but fundamentally, political leaders have to say we've got to try and work together to solve some of these long-term problems rather than just scoring our points in a short-term way. It raises issues, of course, about the electoral system, issues about the conduct of MPs, issue, issues about uh, the way the whipping system works, and so on. But the, at the moment, it's a very frozen system. It needs to change. And the thing I finally just want to end on, the disaffection issue, where you see across the world, whether it's the Tea Party movement in the United States, UKIP, uh, the Front, Front National in, in France, the uh, Syriza in, uh, in Greece, whatever, is of very large numbers of people saying we don't think our political system works, we think it's full of corruption, ineffectiveness, and we want to vote for somebody different, whether of the left or the right or whatever, means that people who can lead that, the Pied Pipers, who can lead that sense of opinion by their positioning can do very well. I personally think that's the explanation for UKIP, i.e. UKIP is less about alienation and wanting to get out of the European Union than it is about that alienated factor. Even the SNP, I think, was largely Alex Salmond uh, being able originally to convince people that he was leading that disaffection against the Westminster bubble in a particular way. I think it's part of the explanation of Jeremy Corbyn's success in winning the leadership of the Labour Party. And actually, it's all not the fault of Jeremy Corbyn, Alex Salmond, the Tea Party or whoever. It's the fault of regular politics, mainstream politicians, for not people like me, if I can put it like that, for failing to set out a sense of vision, failing to prove that we can solve the problems that the country uh, faces. And because when we don't do that, we look complacent, ineffective, and our opponents just take a pop. And that's the challenge of political leadership today, to solve the problems that people are worried about. Thank you very much, Charles Clark. There's plenty that we'll have to talk about there. Um, next, it's a pleasure to introduce Laura Sands, who was the Conservative Member of Parliament for South Thanet from 2010 till 2015. She's now playing a leadership role herself um, in a campaigning group, uh, the European Movement UK, which is campaigning very strongly for Britain to remain part of the European Union. Thank you very much. And it's a great honour to uh, be here. And also, um, thank you to Alan and, and all his team for, for such a great conference. 
And also, it's great fun to follow Charles. Charles has a much more optimistic outlook, I think, on politicians, politics, power, and where it lies than I might have. I was a member of parliament for five years, had a fascinating time, but my description of it, it was a sabbatical from the real world. Anyway, so as I re-enter the human race um, <laughs> and um, start to look back at exactly what I felt political leadership was about and where power lies, because I think this is a fundamental point. Charles was talking about politicians must be able to solve the big problems. Um, I think that that is um, optimistic, to be frank, but there are things that politicians can do, and maybe it is, in many ways, the ambition of politicians is too big, the actual delivery is not considered in enough detail. But when I arrived here today, political leadership, in a strange way, we were talking about political leadership in all sorts of different layers, but very rarely were we talking about political leadership in terms of the leadership of this country to a different place. In many ways, political leadership, is it of the party? Because that's a very big political leadership role. Is it of the country? Is it political leadership in terms of legacy? Um, I've seen people in my, uh, as an observer of politics, being very much a political leader with a mission, but also quite a lot of political leaders who are just quite happy to be top dog. Um, and where does that contrast and conflict happen? Um, if you want to be so-called top dog, then actually managing the party is a very big challenge, and that is your core objective. It is not necessarily having that mission, having that uh, ambition, that sense of destiny, and that sense of vision that Charles rightly says is very lacking. But I have to say, I think the politicians, whether you be top dog, bottom dog, and I was certainly in the doghouse frequently, um, within politics, I think that they think that they have more power than they do. Um, I think power is dissipating from centralised organisations. I think power is driving past Whitehall, not stopping to ask whether it can go ahead and do things, whether that be businesses, whether that be um, organisations, whether it be um, the third sector. People I saw when I was um, very much on a very, very low level um, observer of, of government, um, I saw power being um, in, it foisted or decisions being foisted on government and government merely being a responder. If we look at the world today, it is more dynamic, moving faster, more technological um, interactions. Um, the electorate, dynamic, interesting, um, engaged, this isn't something that government can control. It ne merely has to shape the world into which, which already exists, rather than actually um, be the architect itself. And I would say that government needs to go back to what it used to be. Uh, strange enough, in my dad's day, it used to be called something called an administration. It's a very different concept to a government. And conceptually, we've got to understand that actually so-called the government of today probably can only administer. It can't govern. And that's where we have lost some of our balances on what politicians say that they can do and what they can't do. So every time that there is an accident on the road, a minister turns up and says, there will never be another accident like this. I mean, what is that about? Do they think the public are stupid? Because the public are just not stupid. And this is one of our problems. Politicians say they're 100% right. Well, nobody's 100% right. They say that the other person is 100% wrong. Nobody is 100% wrong. We need to have a greater transparency about decision-making, about balancing. Every single mother sits around a table and sits around that table every morning and makes decisions with the family, with her husband, with the children. Negotiation, consensus, decision-making, rejection, bad decisions. The public understand difficulty, but we tell them that difficulty doesn't exist in our world of black and white. So power is becoming very atomised, and as 
a bit like with every organization, as an organization starts to lose its power, it becomes more activist. So we've got a lot of distractive activism going on across legislation, across initiatives. And I saw one minister when I was um, in Parliament holding this lever, pulling the lever, pull the lever. He pulled it again and again and again. He came out in his hand and he's waving this lever around. Nothing is happening. So you wrap a press release around it. Hey, that gives a little bit more weight, doesn't it? But you see, the public know that this isn't the case. They know that the emperor, on some levels, has no clothes. And what are they doing? They are electing, in many ways, different advocates, different power structures, from Jamie Oliver to Bill Gates to um, you know, new technologies they're engaging with, and they are becoming politicized through those levels. So I think we've got to be realistic about political leadership. I think we've got to contextualise it within where the public are. And I think we have got to have a lot more respect for the public, their understanding that life making decisions is difficult, not easy. I leave you with one very big challenge, because this is not about political leadership, but it is about understanding where the public are. And this is on the European debate. I would like, by the end of this conference, for you to come up with a strap line that works to keep us in Europe. <laughs> On the basis that north of Nottingham, the public believe that Europe is a capitalist conspiracy. South of Europe, uh, south of Nottingham, they think it's a socialist plot. <laughs> London thinks it is the biggest gift that it has ever been given, this opportunity, this platform. In Loughborough, they think that every benefit that Europe has ever delivered this country is only based in London. So we have a three-speed Britain with London, the rest of the country in the perimeter, and all three speeds need to understand that there is a value, I believe, in an international uh, relationship with Europe. And ultimately, that I think it's absolutely crucial that we're at the top table, because otherwise, if those dastardly foreigners have their way, we might find ourselves on the menu. Thank you. Thank you very much, and that is a serious challenge. There you go. <laughs> and, Leave uh, notes at the back, please. Uh, and a very difficult one as well. Finally, someone who will be known to many of you, perhaps to all of you, um, Julian Huppert, who I'm sure you know, was the Liberal Democrat Member of Parliament for Cambridge from 2010 to 2015. He's also a scientist, a biochemist. He's currently, among many other things, um, teaching in the Department of Politics and International Studies on our public policy program, where he is teaching about the role of evidence in policymaking, or rather the lack of <laughs> evidence in policymaking. Julian. Thank you very much, David, and it's uh, great to be back here, and, and Alan, thank you for this, Athene, thank you for this, people I've known from, from past lives. Um, and it's uh, interesting to have a chance to talk about this. When I was the MP, I used to give lots of tours of Parliament, and you can see in the way the building works where power has sat. So I, I don't know how many of you have been, done the full tour of Parliament, but you start off with the royal chambers at one end, where the monarch was in charge, and that's where power went. As you keep going, you get to the House of Lords, where power sat for a very long time. Keep going, you get to the House of Commons. Keep going, you get to the road and Tesco's. And I've always thought that really does say it all about how we are seeing the transition. Now, we've spoken about lots of uh, ideas here, and going third is always uh, difficult because so many interesting and important things uh, have been said. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try very hard not to say all the things that we were just talked about, and there's lots more that we could cover uh, and will, will later. Um, I think there is a lot to be said about how the way that we do politics in this country has led to the decline of trust. There's no doubt that that lack of trust, and I'll come back to some ramifications of that later, has been a problem. And the pettiness, I'm always reminded, uh, it was probably my first year, uh, late in my first year as an MP, there was a debate about youth unemployment. And every single speaker from the opposition benches said, youth unemployment is far too high and it's the government's fault. And every single speaker from the government benches said, youth unemployment is too high and it's the last government's fault. Nobody said anything about what we should do about it because that's too hard. Far, far more important to actually point the finger of blame to other people. Uh, incidentally, David Miliband gave a speech a bit after that where he did try and tackle it, which was very good. But we also have an issue with the difficulty of change, that things are more and more complex. We don't really know how to do it. 
One of the things that I've done since losing is to join the clinical commissioning group here in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. We commission healthcare services, spend out £950 million a year trying to provide healthcare for people here in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. We are the biggest in the country by population, far from the biggest in the country by amount of money we have to spend, which is part of the problem. And one thing it's made me realise is that pretty much every speech I heard from pretty much anybody about the NHS missed the point. It's too hard so people find somewhere where they can actually draw a dividing line and work out who's on which side of it rather than tackle the real challenges. Now, there's two things I particularly want to try and talk about um, that I don't think we've touched on quite. And one of those is about nuance. And one of those is about strained coalitions. Let me start with the coalitions. And I don't just mean the Lib Dem Conservative coalition uh, that we've just had, though there were a couple of strains in that at times. Um, but we're seeing this throughout politics, that the organisations which were there, the parties and other units, are breaking apart and struggling. And so leadership, to me at least, seems to become more and more an exercise in not losing your own people along the way, rather than showing where to go. And there's a, a huge tension between the, the pragmatists, people who want to change uh, policy directly, the purists who want to argue clear positions without compromises. And we can talk about ideas like the Overton window and how that works. Ed Miliband spent a huge amount of his time working out policy positions on many issues that wouldn't lose people either from the right or the left. And so policy was often de devised based on that. And we can see how that's now completely fallen apart in the Labour Party uh, with Corbyn, who very much isn't able to hold every body together. There's a separate issue here, I'll come on to this in nuance as well. Labour spent five years arguing that there were two sides. There was the side of good and there was the side of evil. Uh, people like Lib Dems like myself were clearly on the side of evil because we were working with the Conservatives. And then when there was a leadership contest, most of the candidates tried to explain that there was nuance. And they discovered that spending five years saying there wasn't any and then explaining there was, was very tricky to do. So Ed Miliband was struggling like that. We saw the same thing with David Cameron. If you look, for example, at European policy, time and time again, he was driven into short-term tactical positions to avoid problems with Eurosceptics and UKIP. We're now in a long-term position, which was not designed, but we reached uh, in separate ways. Another comment on Cameron, I was always interested in what he was trying to lead people to. Uh, I, I have to say, I think he's very much uh, the sort of person who believes that he's the sort of person who should be in charge, rather than having a vision about where he wants to be. That's the leadership uh, as person in power. I see, I see a grin there. <laughs> I, I, I won't quote you on it. Um, we see similar tensions by some of the other parties. The Greens have this huge split between the more socialist Greens and the environmental Greens, who have very, very different aims. UKIP have a split. Are they a right-wing party? Are they trying to pick up uh, the, the, the working class they feel Labour has left behind? Patrick O'Flynn has a very different view to Nigel Farage. We, have, we had our own issues. The SNP uh, remarkably have managed to occupy a position where they are both in government and an anti-government force. Uh, and it's really remarkable how many people voted in Scotland for the SNP because health and education in Scotland were simply not good enough. <laughs> and we see this around the rest of the world. One could see the European Union as a, a coalition that's falling apart, Republicans and Democrats, Australian parties as well. So that's the problem of strained coalitions. How do you keep people together and provide some momentum as well? And it's complicated particularly by nuance because public policy, interesting public policy, is really hard. We have some of the students from the MPP programme. None of it's easy. Uh, good, I'm, I'm glad they've, they've realised that. Now, some things are, you know, you could talk about the death penalty. That could be a fairly easy thing. But lots of other things are much, much, much more complex. But we keep trying to simplify them and make out that there is two sides, a very simple space, and that causes problems. And you couple that with echo chambers, and that get, makes it much, much worse. And then... You take a position we have now where you don't need to get mass support in order to win. We've now reached the stage where about 36% is enough to get majority government. And other than the House of Lords being difficult, you can then do anything that you like. And if you only need to get about a third of the votes to get a majority, you can afford to ignore and alienate 60% of the electorate because it doesn't matter. I mean, I'd be happy with 36% for a Lib Dems, but, you know... <laughs> Um, but so people just aim the comments at the people that they need to get in order to win. And that means that echo chamber is really bad. Social media is brilliant. I'm a huge advocate of Twitter. Um, I was, in the last parliament, the first of the MPs to have actually been on Twitter before I was one. But it really creates echo chambers. People talk to each other all the time. We saw this in the AV referendum. The AV referendum had campaigns and messages which were absolutely brilliant and persuasive if you believed in AV. 
And they were tested out on other people on Twitter who also had believed in AV and nobody else. They didn't persuade anybody else. There's a lot of research on this. There's a brilliant book, uh, Jane's Probability Theory, uh, The Logic of Science, really goes into some of this. Every other page is technical. Just skip those pages. The rest of it's quite readable. People listen to messages and believe messages from those they already believe. And people segment more and more. And we had a debate, Laura and I, did, rather bravely, I think, did a debate against UKIP uh, and Patrick O'Flynn. I've done two of them. One of them in Cambridge, where it was about 300 in favour of staying in, six against. One in Peterborough, where it was something like 250 to 16. Um, but what was interesting... The other way, yes, sadly. <laughs> but what was interesting about it was it was a great example of how it is impossible to have a conversation with some of these people. Most of the audience were UKIP members, I believe, UKIP activists. And anything that they didn't agree with, that didn't support their view, they would deride and shout down as a lie. Anything. A survey I mentioned was a lie. I mean, it was flawed. It was a survey. They're all, you know, there's problems with all surveys. The most remarkable one, it's good to have Laura here again, was at one point somebody said, there is no way that Churchill would have stood for any of this European stuff. <laughs> and <laughs> Laura pointed out that he was one of the founders of the European movement, which got this tirade of, that's a lie. And it's very, very hard to persuade anybody of something if they are that far away that they will deride anything as a lie. And this feeds back into the disaffection. Um, I could say a lot more about social media and the roles and how uh, accuracy um, is, is rather less good because messages can pass around so fast without any fact-checking. And any other process of oversimplification also feeds back. Any time an organisation like They Work For You, trying to do very good things, tries to capture an entire debate into a for something or against something, it's missed a lot of the nuance which can heavily mislead people. The last thing I'll say before I finish was about 38 Degrees, because I think they're a really interesting example. Are you familiar with 38 Degrees, the sort of uh, online campaigning site? And they were set up with the very best of intentions. They really were. David Babs had a really good idea about trying to engage the public, something we should be trying to do. And they did very well. There are problems with getting people to sign petitions. People often sign things without reading them. Uh, I used to chair the Cambridge Traffic Management Committee, and it was always interesting to see how many people would have signed the petition for and against a particular measure. But the problem they had is they grew very fast. And they needed to get money in order to keep paying their staff. And you can't get money by saying, here is a complex issue, here's some information about either side, make your own mind up, oh, and give us some money. And so increasingly, they've been forced into a position of saying, this thing will be the end of all that is good in the country, or this is essential to save everything, this will destroy the NHS, this will create the NHS, whatever it is. It has to be absolutely cataclysmic so that they can get the money that's needed to keep going. This isn't just about 38 Degrees, it's about many of the campaigning organisations that actually need to have that thing that is evil so that they can be the people who are good. And that, I think, fosters even more of this segregation uh, which was involved with some of the Corbyn issues. The last election I found deeply frustrating, not just because I didn't win, but because the election became about who did you distrust more? The question was, do you distrust Ed Miliband and the SNP or do you distrust David Cameron? We weren't the answer to that question, which is why we did particularly so bad, one of the reasons we did so badly. But it's really depressing we've got to that stage. So how do we get to true leadership that actually keeps values, that actually works in reality, that holds people together, and that with resonates with the public and reaches out broadly? I don't really have a good answer to that, but I can see some of the problems. Thanks.